Hello. <laughs> Thanks so much, all of you, for coming out um, to see Michael, Anania, and Reginald Gibbons read their poetry. Um, please feel free after the reading to stick around, um, talk to talk to our readers, buy books from them, and uh, browse around the store as well. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll introduce our first reader, Michael Ananaya. Um, he's a poet, essayist, and fiction writer. Um, his published work includes 12 collections of poetry um, and a new collection, Continuous Showings, due out this year. His poetry is widely anthologized and has been translated into Italian, German, French, Spanish, and Czech. He has also published a novel, The Red Menace, and a collection of essays in plain sight. <clears throat> Ananaya has taught at SUNY at Buffalo, uh, Northwestern University, and the University of Chicago, and is Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He lives in Austin, Texas, and on Lake Michigan. So please welcome Michael Ananaya. Thank you. It's never easy to decide what to read or how to start one of these evenings, but today, I was driving home and I heard that uh, there's a program at the Cactus Cafe tonight about Bill Evans. So I have two Bill Evans poems and this one is easy choice because it was uh, first published by Reg in the Triport. So it's called Gin Music. You listen for a long time, half listen even. And then one day something catches you almost off guard, a little bit of sense to it buoyed up out of the familiarity of things. I'm thinking of Bill Evans in particular, the way he sometimes hesitates as though the keys are pressed part way down and then reluctantly strike their notes. It seems to be a slight, there seems to be a slight breath there, if you know what I mean. Well, listen for it, it's there. Like something you need to say but don't really want to let it out except that you're already into it, so what can you do? And beside the person you're talking to, well, she already knows what has to come next. Just like we know, listening, that it's going to go on to the next part of the song, My Foolish Heart, for example. There's almost a sigh right at the beginning, and again, each time he gets to the center of it, a deep breath taken in and expelled. And then the notes come on like words you don't know you're going to have to pay for in the long run. I could listen to that guy forever. It's like me being played or you or any of us, the part you don't quite remember. How she waited just for a second for the words to fall out the way they had to. And how you waited, your mouth already shaped into what you were about to say. And here it is back again, the ache of it. That's it, isn't it? The ache that somehow gets lost. Well, not really lost, but detached from the plain facts of the story. Then suddenly it's back inside this piece of music, a taste that seeps up from the bottom of your mouth. So you put the record on, or you hum through it, or you go off to some joint just in case it comes out right. But mostly you want to play it yourself just once so that your fingers be, would be the ones settling down on the keys, and it would be your shoulders hunching, then pulling back, just as the flat of the keyboard softened in your hands. And you would be caught there between silence and music, and the music would pull you along, and whatever you said or did leaning towards sound would be jazz, and the smoke would curl its faded indigo over the black lacquer of the piano and the ice would clink, clink in the dark, and faces would half turn and turn back, and the song would ease its way out into the room like a root extending itself into damp soil and take leaf and flower. I always read something old. As an older person, it gives me a sense of continuity. So this very old rock and roll poem called Lines for Grace Slick. Grace Slick was the late singer of the Jefferson Airplane. So that's you. Well, everybody here is old enough. I just look like maybe he is. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, each section of the poem begins with a line taken from a medieval poem by the Pearl Poet. Now, this, this is hard, right? 
Not quite the light. There it is. So, lines for Grace. Grace. It was a lady carried a knife, as they say, on or about her person, sidewalks and alleyways, unlit entrances. She knew and moved among them with grace, with open spot. The blade she flashed, looking for the least flaw of light along the edge, up to its quick sprung hilt, the love they spoke began and ended with switch words and gentilessa. Swinging the telephone by the cord caught him just above the ear, the cone of the mouthpiece spinning away, round shaft cracked in two, dial tone sustained, not nah, travail there, ready to alter by saying, touching, pieces fall like china, noises that succeed his fall, dull sound of collapsed clothing, she had no refrain. If you live in a big city, or you have, then you know that the subway system is divided between two kinds of stops, the A stop and the B stop, so it's an A train and a B train, and then there are AB, the big stations. You have to know that to know what happens to this poem called Echo. How sudden they seem, the gradual lives of flowers, or the faces you see in the brief light of a B stop, taking as you always do, the A train. You go. Now it's that's for David. Would you read that again? Sure. It went by so fast. How sudden they seem, the gradual lives of flowers, or the faces you see in the brief light of a bee stop, taking as you always do, the A train. Set to music by uh, Bill Russo. Mm -hmm. And a little painting poem uh, called De Kooning. This is, has to do with a very, very late show of De Kooning's after presumably he had Alzheimer's. <coughs> How is it the light grows furious once again, yellow and orange, then wafts into a green clarity? She waits in curve and fold the cleft of her, drifting in a white rest, a blank space that urges space along, the way in music, silence drives the song. Um, this is an Italian poem. Uh, my father's family is from Calabria in southern Italy, which was in the ancient world called Mania Graeca. It was and the boundary that, that, that Aristotle describes to the Greek world is just north of, uh, south of Naples, just north of where my father's family's village is from, is uh, located. And, uh, I hope that's bothering me. Oh, that would be Oh, oh, that's just, okay, this is fine. <laughs> Can we put this one closer? Maybe. That's it. That's it. I busted it on my heart. But... Anyway, so this is called Turnings, and it's uh, for Enzo Agostino, who's an Italian Calabrian poet who was translated some of my other poems into Italian. Um, and this is an elegy for him. Um, what you need to know about the poem is that it gets involved with the, with the idea of the underworld in Greek mythology and the fact that you go to this place where you have to drink of a well of forgetfulness before you pass into the other world. And the figure in that, at, at that place, is Persephone. Uh, so this is called Turnings. It's a description of this space. Evening is liquid here, shadows welling into each shape, each valley cut and crevice. The sky still bright, its lapis, sun streaked, the sea, both seas, darkening past Homer. So soon as the spirit has left the light, rectangular slips of gold embossed their Greek, somewhat italic, found in Thurii, in Pierre Castello La Quarry, suspended now behind glass in the Castello at Viva Valencia, 
charms hammered as though with fire and light, the sun offered back to the dark field. So soon on the right side of Anoya, a spring in thought that is, lifting itself up out of memory. Though the reading is somewhat doubtful, folds in the gold obliterating letters, parts of letters, words, the sense is clear, prayer and safe passage, pure it says, from pure to purity I come. Gold out of earth and fire, speech, spirit and light returning suppliant in her blessed company. Funeral offerings, of course, but folded and carried by Greeks at the Calabrian edge of Greece, the half-day journey from sea froth to sea froth, following one river upstream, the other, other down, from Tamasia to Eponium, Scalatium <coughs> to Petalia, merchants and colonists death touched each evening, rising sounds and stirrings, the scillas, mountains, caves, and streams, Aquavona, Riventinu, rough passage, passages that saddle deep into shadow, chestnut burrs, murmuring over leaf mold. In Calabria sta sera sta notte, elusis, the enfolding darkness is still underfoot. Or beautiful this evening's beauty, the sea running white from Punto Stello south past Locri, a sparrow hawk wheeling above pebble stone refuge, pin feathers catch the mountain light, the west still streaming eastward out of reach. I am, the gold leaf says, like you, a child of earth and heaven. Upland from the tourist littered beach, joyosa, jejusa, the sun plays its last small strains like mandolin music, starlight and sound in shadow there, your spirit drowsing, cradled at its home in speech and light. A spindle full of flax, its light votive drawn out and spun, bent fingers lifting bright strands like <coughs> filaments from the still air again and again, the olive wood bobbin bobbing above her feet. Her song is whispers, names, circling names, each one said into her hands, the thread like a rosary without pause or end, Enzo and each other Enzo, Angelo, Michele, Dominic, Bruno, Raffaele, so many passing from light into darkness and curled at the black folds of her skirt. Uh, they still, as a folk thing, spin yarn that way, in the spin thread that way, in Calabria. And I was in Florence at dinner with the principal Etruscan scholar, and he mostly wanted to show me his book of, with 90 pages of those bobbins, photographs of all of the, and they're exactly the same, they're round, they have little scorings on them to move the thread, and uh, so the Etruscans were spinning thread exactly the same way the Calabrians, in, uh, mostly at folk festivals. Anyway, that was from Mark. We were talking yesterday, and nobody's here from that talk, but I thought I'd do this poem anyway, about particulars. Somebody suggested that particularity in poetry started the day before yesterday or someplace in the 20th century. So I, this poem, a friend of mine was giving a reading in some place in Iowa and he called and he said he needed an Italian poem or a poem with an Italian setting that would be interesting to farmers. <laughs> so I wrote this poem. It's called The Georgic. And all of the details in this poem come from Virgil. Virgil talked of, of corn, of farmers at their work, the shadows that move up their hillsides at evening, rain, sunlight after rain, and cloudless skies. Of plants that rise up unbidden and bear no fruit, birds and their plunder, salt land and gravel, and rich soil that falls black from the plow shear. Of land flat and, gla and glad with moisture, of stubble left fallow in the crust on unstirred fields, fierce sun and frostbite. How in time the crop levels the furrow, how mildew devours the corn, how thistle and burrs can overcome a crop. And of the farmer at home, sweet children clinging to his knees, the holidays kept and the sacred piety of his household. Under the shade of a spreading beech, Virgil sang of fields and flocks 
and trees of bees among ripening apples, shrill locusts, haylofts, and brimming water troughs. And thought of tillers marched away, the plow's measure of honor gone, of Caesar bending sickles into stiff sword blades and hurling war's lightnings at the high Euphrates. I should write that for George W. Bush. <laughs> uh, yeah. Read some newer stuff. I'll read this one because Reg wrote a little essay about it. Bummer, we friends here. Farm machinery in a vacant lot. I was in someplace in Wisconsin and walked up the hill to the middle of town and in a space where there had been some storefronts, obviously, it was a vacant lot full of weeds and farm machinery. So, this is all. Weld lines on drive wheels, rust and midsummer weeds. The drag grater cattywampus, its iron seat turned sideways. A case one bottom pole plow, green enamel dull toward gray. Farm all red gone to burnt orange. An Oliver horse-drawn sulky plow, black as a Dutch oven. Two-row cultivator and spring-toothed harrow. An angled one-knife subsoiler and squat New Holland baler all set out in the space between empty storefronts, unmarked, merely at rest there, unlikely as though collected to some purpose and then abandoned, toothed cutters, sprung and ratcheted lift handles, reaper blades, linchpins, spare parts. Shears and wheel bands scattered among cord grass and bottle brush, Work is sketched out here in iron and forged steel, a hand at each blade, knees and shoulders greased and bent, <coughs> the, the day-long clatter, jostled plow seats sprung on a single steel leaf, reins blackened with sweat and lather. Traffic eases along this main street, its commerce long gone. Nobody goes to town anymore. They shop at malls two or three villages west, out where the superhighways whine all day and night like tree locusts. Beyond their farm-sized parking lots, cul-de-sacs multiply across corn stubble and buffalo grass. So many fair views, Hudson Heights, clear creeks, and deer runs, named like cars from lists of genial falsehoods. There are no views and no heights. The creeks have all been diverted and the deer run off or harvested. William Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State, said that because of the reaper, the line of cultivation moved westward 30 miles per year. Cyrus McCormick took it to heart and made an advertisement out of it. Westward, the course of empire takes its way with McCormick reapers in the vanguard, and Deering's platform reaper, and John Deere's forged steel self-polishing plow faces, unshorn, boundless, and beautiful, the prairies turn 30 miles each year, shoulders bent over the sulky plow's sideways seat, over the harrow's sprung teeth, discs polished furrow after furrow, the lowered cutters, steel blades, sheaves, machine gathered and bound. I don't know how long I've gone, because I don't remember where I started, so basically just give up his hooks. <laughs> when I came to Austin, I had uh, moved away from my familiar spaces, so I uh, tried to figure out what I would do about writing in a space that and I, I didn't know that well, so I went to the library and I got a lot of books about, about Texas landscape, Texas geology, Texas agronomy, and I looked at them in, in a stack in my study and took them back to the library because I didn't have time, I thought, for yet another subject matter. So what I did was, I noticed that I was listening to jazz music outside of my house, so I decided to write a group of jazz poems set 
in Texas, because that's where I live. Father's radio program, which was called Jam in the Morning, but I Jam for Breakfast, jam for breakfast and I call this, that guy I misremembered, Morning Jam. He gave me permission to mutilate his father's title. This is called Thursday's Child, about the modern jazz quartet. The intricate work of live oak trees in sunlight, one hard edge shade after another, branches shagged with pale green moss, random play within a f limited field then, leaf, leaf cluster, light, sh shade, shadow, and act, wave, and particle. John Lewis and Milt Jackson morning places you at such infinitesimal distances from consequence Precision seems the natural way things choose to be ordered. Touch the table edge as though it too were an instrument, cup, glass, bowl, and spoon, a single blackberry stem etched like punctuation into the saucer's pale rim, leaves, as I said, and branches. And the last one of these called Saturday in Turn, uh, <coughs> based on a song called Ruby, My Dear. Ruby throated this morning's hummingbird, trembling at the yellow hibiscus, a cartoon quarter note just played. Coltrane and Monk at the five spot, 1957, New York's Ruby aflame and spinning past the subway stairs, 8th Street, the city's dank underground breath riffling her skirt, her high heels spiking the damp pavement, shadow Wilson and Wilbur Ware, heel tap, and the taut seams of her figured stockings. My dear, someone said, as though in passing, as much breath and touch as speech. <coughs> and then a few even newer things. That's the manuscript of continuous showings. This is the trouble you get in afterwards. Um, very short poem. We were talking about language. Uh, this poem for Charles Tomlinson, who was a friend, died last spring. So it's called Durations for Charles Tomlinson. The second half of the poem is an account of Hopi uh, grammar. So, durations. Yucca, blue flax, pinions and their shadows, snakeweed. Each mesa has its own dialect, each tree its own habit. Pronghorn deer graze here, listen to feathered clouds passing. A suffix meaning always, another just then and just now. The present opening its own occasions like the stained rainwater makes in dry soil, just then, just now, as ever. And then, this is all very new stuff. Oh, I promised Philip that I would read his poem. Read more poems than I thought. Oh, here it is. Archways and Passages, it's called. It begins with a quote, two lines quoted from Robert Duncan. So, Archways and Passages for Philip Trussell. When all things mix and the dreamers dance, shadows sorted into mottled light, arms, breasts, and thighs, his reach and her forward glance, blackened particles silvered and falling, light or shade in consequence of sight. As Parrish might have imagined them at play, their arching clarities, or Poussin out of Bayon, or Apelius, the long slope of Arcady, fields greening toward shade, drifted then, as though gods and heroes might once again preside, slim adolescent, nymph or satyr, now the sudden curl of seawater, darkening bright sand, its breath opening damp pores, a pale arm strung with kelp, flexed against Okeanos. Dreams fluttering like pages in the wind, words and leaves spun, their mask played out, garden scents, witch cat, whose bell, song its airy architectures as certain as stone, each lively in its own sweet time, 
of the torque centered in the bud flowering. That said, winter evening light caught here among darkening cedars and held fast. The frayed black strands of shag bark counted out as rests, something we measure for ourselves, hands extended, as though in reaching we could play the air itself, rhythms those other figures might sway to, spaces marked in time, the wind as his right arm lifts, branches proposing a kind of yearning, line is always narrative, one cause and then another, effects dreamed or wished into place, the doge, lamp black in shadows, all that seems likely remains a question of intent, marks the bristles, chisel toward fable, how we linger like dust in the light, to leave the, un to leave the known world and pass into what world? A latticework of systems snarled within systems, particulars hived around us, change, touch, hope for, as though its arc could be followed through space, its chill always sudden, surprising, the way the liquids of painting and photograph pause for us, their occasions not so much certain as probable, outcomes of hand, eye, light, arm, tablature, and breath. One more thing. Well, my friend Van Wolf said he was going to be here tonight, but he didn't come, so I'm not going to read his poem. Take that. <clears throat> oh, he's called Oasis Wares comes from a poem by a very unknown 16th century poet named Harrington. I see my life a way so wears that I, myself, myself despise. And most of all, wherewith I strive is that I see myself alive. A way so wears. It is, I think, the long slope of dreaming. You wake from its certainties uncertain. The emperor's puzzle with you each morning. Which flight? Which husk is this? Its voice is so clear, still the light through your east window silences them. This is the other you, my second self, speaking as always out of turn. Love is what we fail at, waking and sleeping. It is only my own warmth, the space under the covers I turn into, nothing more. A shadow sleep leaves behind the present absence Something so easily made slight, morning's brief portion of darkness. Once there was the odor of peat, damp loam and seedlings. The breath soil draws in and through the long night expels, nymph leaf uncurling, her shape lifting and falling beside me. Well, that's a dark ending. <laughs>